Again, if you should need any information from the slides that I'm over here, just uh, in the next future you can uh, get it from the internet. No problem. So you don't bother uh, writing down or taking notice. And uh, usually for the uh, graduate students, we should have this course in a rather kind of a seminar way that we discuss, we, we talk, and uh, perhaps uh, the participants can make some presentation. And, uh, but uh, if the course is really to be, there will be no point. And uh, we do have uh, very bad experiences, like uh, the participants in the last few years, Sometimes they just uh, write, it, write things up without a, 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 a deeper insight. So this kind of a presentation will do little help. And perhaps uh, if the course is really so big, we just change the, 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 the form. Just have it like a, a normal lecture. And, uh, but uh, still, if there should be any questions, which is really welcome. And uh, the history of Taiwan, the course of the Taiwanese history, we only have, uh, say, at most six, uh, 14 sessions. And it is certainly impossible to uh, have to give you a, a, a clear view, clear idea about Taiwanese history in this say, 14 sessions. So I will give you only some highlights, give you some ideas, and uh, if there should be anything that you really want to know, just uh, let us know, perhaps we can arrange to talk about a special topic in the course of, in the due course. So uh, if you, there's no special demands, special wishes, we just uh, all the uh, syllabus. That you can see in the uh, internet, right? And uh, certainly there are some uh, issues, hard issues. I know the chairman knows the hardest thing to talk about is the uh, film about the uh, Taiwanese uh, originals. So uh, sometimes I probably could have shown a short paragraph, a short section of this film, and then perhaps you might be able to join. Cultivated 
as a place for the uh, agriculture, for the development of the government, for the development of other organized activities of the society. So uh, we shall start from the Dutch East India Company, which uh, arrived in Taiwan in the 17th century. At the end, actually, the end of the 16th century, at the beginning of the 18th, 17th century, then the Taiwanese uh, history as a, actually a new start. Okay, you see these slides here. All right. Uh, what is Dutch history in Germany? As you know, that in the 17th, 16th century, there is actually a serious uh, conflict in Europe about the religious uh, matters, like uh, Martin Luther started the uh, proclamation of uh, the right of uh, every believer to communicate with God. And this is the, uh, according to the uh, process of uh, reformation. The, reform the word reformation might not be really correct for the uh, Catholics I don't think it should be a reform, but rather a, a rebel. But uh, nowadays we always call it reformation because uh, most of the uh, textbook in English are written by those uh, Protestants. Uh, so they want to call it reformation. And uh, the Taiwan history actually started with the uh, reformation because the Netherlands at that stage was actually ruled by the Spanish royal house. While the, uh, most of the, the Netherlands, the Dutch people, actually converted to, uh, to a communism. So there is actually a religious struggle. And this struggle between Catholicism and Catholicism and uh, Protestantism actually prolonged to Taiwan. That is one of the reasons we started here in the 16th century Europe. And in the meantime, this is a very important activity. We call it the Great Discovery, which is not really a discovery, but not so great, because uh, from then on, the, when the uh, Columbus arrives the Northeast America, or Latin America, there is actually a disaster for the uh, local people, but uh, to the Europeans, actually, you most of the European benefited from this uh, so-called discovery. And the uh, great voyage that the uh, European ships arrived in Europe, uh, 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 Africa arrived, say, nowadays Southeast Asia, and then from Southeast Asia, gradually, the uh, European ship merchants arrived in uh, East Asia, including China and Japan. So because this uh, sea route is really so profitable, a lot of countries have actually started to uh, organize the so-called company. The monopolized for a certain route, sea route. You have the uh, East Indian Company, you have the Baltic Company, you have the Levant Company. So most of the, every, each and every one of the companies uh, have the exclusive rights to do business. Actually, in this case, those uh, companies, they actually fight against each other. Like uh, we have here, the VLC, the Dutch, United East Indian Company, which was established in 1602. Before, uh, two years before, there is a old company organized by the British merchants, as well as from the Royal Capital. It is the British uh, East Indian Company. Right? They fought against each other all the way. But uh, the Spanish merchants, as well as the Portuguese merchants, arrived to China, arrived to Thailand first. Right? Because uh, since Columbus time, the uh, 
Iberian Peninsula, they organized, first of all, the uh, ships to uh, uh, Eastern Asian waters. And uh, therefore, we say that now that you see the Philippines, you can see the, uh, the uh, Indonesia. The Philippines, the name is derived from the, the Spanish king, Philip II. Right? The, therefore, the word or the country of Philippines means the land that belongs to the Philippines. The, 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 the Spanish merchants discovered or conquered this land and devoted it to the king. That's why it was the Philippines. And then again, the Dutch East, East, Dutch East India Company decided to fight, to follow the uh, Spanish ships to the East, Ocean, East Asian waters to fight against the, the, the Spanish. Actually, they have a activity called uh, Sea Bailers. In the international law, there is a thing called the Letter of Mark, which means that country will actually issue a letter to the merchants, allow them uh, allow them to loot, to uh, confiscate, to rob the, uh, the enemies. And this letter of war was quite common in the 16th, 17th century. So the Dutch East Indian Company arrives in East Asian waters to try to uh, loot, to uh, rob. Spanish, and as well as the Portuguese ships, which they were very successful. You know, nowadays there is a, a porcelain called Karak. Uh, there is the porcelain purchased by the Portuguese company in, say, in China, in Japan, and then confiscated or robbed by the Dutch sea bakers. And the Dutch ship sea bakers sold it in the European market at a very low price. This kind of uh, porcelain is really common. Nowadays, in most of the uh, museum, you still can find this Karak. Uh, uh, the Karak was, was actually the name of the, of the type of the uh, ships used by the Portuguese. Okay, the Dutch East Indian Company arrived in Asia in 16, the early 16, 17th century, and uh, the capital of the VOC, or the Dutch East India Company, is raised to the bond, to the stock market. Therefore, we, what we saw nowadays about the uh, stock market, about the bond, was actually very popular in the 17th century. I will give you a proof of that. And uh, yeah, this is the bond. Uh, the capital was actually raised in the uh, early 17th century by the Dutch merchants, and then they started to organize uh, uh, ships to come to East, uh, East Asia. The merchants, the merchandise, the goods they wanted here in, in this area, mainly was actually tea, you know, silk, and uh, porcelain. And sometimes medicine was actually a very popular, welcome uh, item like uh, the, the Chinese herbs. As we know that uh, there was always uh, some kind of uh, disease, like the Black Death in Europe, which was, there's no, there was no cure at that stage. <coughs> People always believed in the uh, strange <coughs> remedies, and therefore they just wanted to purchase some like spices. If you should go to uh, Sumatra, they purchased the nutmeg, what else? Uh, all this kind of, uh, of pepper, for example, they all bring, brought it back to Europe, sold it at a very high price, and uh, made all this trip very profitable. And therefore, the uh, merchants arrived in this area doing business. And uh, they, at that stage, the fresh water was really rare. They needed some trace, some traces to. Uh, uh, refresh and get the fresh water, get supplies. So they need uh, to set up a, a base all the way along the route. And uh, for example, the Goa was actually one of the places. Uh, Sumatra 
Singapore, and later on they come to Taiwan. Uh, since Taiwan was claimed by no authority, Taiwan was claimed by no power, and it was really convenient for those merchants to come to Taiwan. <coughs> so Taiwan became actually a meeting point for the traders. And uh, you must have heard about the, the term imperialism. But the imperialists or the imperial activities starting in the 17th century, whenever they go, they conquer, just like what Caesar said. Uh, I came, I saw and I conquer. They conquer whatever. Like uh, nowadays in Africa, in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines, and also they conquer to Taiwan. So the Dutch, Kanki Sinai Company, started to uh, organize Taiwan as the stronghold and uh, do business here and uh, since there is a very special product, a special thing in Taiwan, the Sika Dia. There is a deer that uh, one at some stage there is more deer in Taiwan than people. And this deer is really easy to catch to, 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 to catch and therefore even the, the, the skin, the fur of the deer is actually a very important food for European. So gradually the Dutch people realized that it's a very nice place to stay. So on this slide you can see some introduction about the, uh, the activities of the Dutch East India Company. As I mentioned, that uh, it will be, will be made available very soon. So, this the religious aspects I was talking about. This this person is from the Habsburg family, one of the offspring, and uh, succeeded his father, Charles the Fifth, and became actually one of the most influential or rich monarch in. Europe, the root of Spain, as well as the Netherlands. For a certain time, he was also king of Portugal, and uh, he's a very devoted Catholic. Uh, Catholic. And, uh, one of his uh, aim to rule was actually to fight against the communism, and uh, he was actually involved with the uh, engaging in war affairs against a lot of the uh, uh, countries, like, uh, I think they know the term 30 years war, starting from 1618 to 1648. The 30 years war was actually uh, a term to describe the, what happened in West Europe, in East Europe, uh, sorry, in West Europe, but in, in the, warf the warfare or the struggle between the Netherlands and Spain lasted even longer. So in the Dutch history, they call it the 80 years war. And then the sea battle was actually organized. Okay. So, uh, Philip II was actually king of Spain from 1556 to uh, 1598. He was also king of Nablus, king of Sicily. He was also, of course, king of consort, king consort of England. His wife was actually his auntie, uh, the nicknamed Bloody Mary. And uh, when Bloody Mary died, he asked the hand of Elizabeth, but Elizabeth uh, rejected, turned him down. He was also lord of the 17th provinces, that is the, um, the uh, now is the, uh, the Netherlands. And uh, since the king of Portugal died, there was no, no heir, and uh, he had some royal blood from the Portugal royal family, therefore he became king of Portugal since uh, between 1580. 1998. And uh, again, we have noticed this thing. The first 
foreigners arrived in this area it was actually Portuguese. The name, you must have heard the name Formosa. You yeah, have Formosa. Formosa was actually a Portuguese term to describe the so called beautiful island. But Taiwan is not the beautiful island. Taiwan is actually one of the Formosas. Uh, for a long time, there was actually more than 20 Formosas along the uh, sea route of the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese fleet. As you know, most of the people were actually called the lovers, dear, dear, and sometimes dear is nothing, because you can dear everybody. So the, you can Formosa everybody as well. So there is more than enough Formosa. Taiwan is only one of them. And uh, the when the Spanish king became the king of Portugal, then the there was we we'll call it the personal union. <coughs> then the before that, the, the Spanish fleets were not allowed to come to Taiwan, come to East Asia, because uh, 1494 there was a line, there was a contract, a treaty between Spain and Portugal, witnessed by the Pope drawing the whole world into two parts. And the Portuguese get one part, the eastern part, and the Spanish get the western part. And therefore, the, uh, before, between 1494 and 1580, only Portuguese were allowed to come to, to, come to say, East Asia. Therefore, nowadays you see the Goa was actually a, was a Portuguese colony. And this line was actually passed by the uh, Latin America. So there's only one country in Latin America speaking Portuguese. This Brazil. That was because of the uh, demarcation line. So after 1580, the, the, the things changed because uh, the king of Portugal <coughs> was also king of Spain. And therefore, the Spanish king allowed the uh, the Spanish merchants to sail to these waters and uh, the Spanish presses the, therefore started in uh, East Asia. So, uh, what is again the background of the, uh, the, uh, the Dutch activity against the Spanish just have to know about each other, the sea beggars. And that's why we say that there's always conflict. You must have to know about, know about the, uh, <coughs> the place called Macau. Right? Macau, the term was derived from the temple, from the Mata temple. So this week we will be, we will be introduced into uh, the Taiwanese region. The Macau was actually a very popular protector of the sailors. Um, Portuguese arrived in the area, now this Macau, and they ask, what, what is this place? What's the name of the place? They say it's the Macau, the, uh, the Master Temple. Uh, was, the uh, local people met only this place, this Master Temple, but the Portuguese call it Macau, <coughs> to, to, to refer to the whole islands. Um, the Portuguese actually provided the Chinese with some modern, or, or, or then modern uh, instruments as well as uh, weaponry and cannons. Because uh, at the end of the 16th century, the Chinese were actually fighting against the nomads, the uh, Manchus. And at that stage, the cannon was actually very important. So the Portuguese provided the Chinese with the uh, cannon, and the Chinese government was delighted with the uh, Portuguese service. Therefore, they allowed the, the Portuguese to stay in this offshore island, now this Macau. When the sea when the sea beggars arrived, when the, the Dutch fleet arrived, they want to attack, of course, Macau. But since Macau was actually considered as the Chinese uh, territory, the Chinese helped the uh, Portuguese to fight against the uh, Dutch sea beggars, Dutch fleet. <coughs> Therefore, the Dutch decided, okay, now we 
somehow had to find a better place. They went to pescadores. Again, this, this term, pescadores, was actually meaning, in Portuguese, meaning fish harvest. Uh, you know the Italian or, or Spanish pesca is actually fish. Pescadores is nowadays, we call it Calumbo Island. I don't know. That is the, uh, in English, or in the, the foreign names, Pescadores, also named by the Portuguese. So the Dutch arrived Pescadores and decided to conquer this land for the Aztec stronghold. And Pescadores was actually uh, in the, uh, the Chinese government set up an authority there, an uh, office there, and uh, therefore the Chinese decided to drive the Dutch away from his Pescadores. So then the Dutch was uh, advised by the uh, pirates, pirates and uh, the local people to come to Taiwan. Uh, at that stage, the end of the uh, 17th century, uh, sorry, the end of 16th century, early of 17th century, uh, Taiwan was actually not a part of Chinese territory and uh, was considered a very dangerous place by the Chinese government because a lot of pirates from Japan or the, from the Chinese local pirates they were stuck over in Taiwan right? and Taiwan became the uh, nest of this, the, 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 the pirates and uh, from, Ch from the Chinese point of view if they can drive the Dutch fleet, the Dutch people to Taiwan, might be a good idea. Let them fight against each other. And uh, that's why the Dutch people arrived in Taiwan. Okay. Uh, from this point, this chair, you can see those, uh, this was the standard route for the European uh, companies or European merchants right here. You can go across the, uh, is the, the Cape of Good Hope. And you come to the, uh, India. Go out is actually one of the shop base for the, for the, by the Standard Pathologies and these archivists. In Indonesia, you can come to the uh, areas. And then finally, you arrive to Taiwan. So you see. Situation of the 17th century. So, uh, 1596, Dutch merchants started to get the <coughs> monopoly and they decided to come to East Asia uh, because at that stage, 17th century, the, the European merchants loved to come to East Asia. Lots of uh, spices. And uh, it was actually calculated in the 17th century, the profits would be about 1,000 times. I just invest $1 and, and uh, the return would be actually 1,000 dollars. Provided that you come home safely. You know, a lot of people actually drowned, can see rice areas. Right. It was very easy for them to drive this route because of the monsoon. So you, once you understand, it's not money, it's a no problem. But in this area, a lot of high volume inheritance, and especially in the uh, summer season, all these hurricanes, the typhoons, can cause a huge damage. And uh, actually, Still, now in Sumatra, in this area, all these uh, divers can find shipwreck all the time in, in the sea, in the sea bench. And if you get up a, a, a shipwreck, you know how much, how many things you can get, especially the porcelain. They were known as in the international market, the porcelain, uh, porcelain of the Ming Dynasty, about 17th century, was actually very cheap because uh, in this area. It's a lot of shipwreck. And therefore, the uh, it was really hard for them to uh, travel all these routes. Usually, you started from Europe, any port of Europe, it will take you about say, six months to 
come to uh, China, any port in, in China, six months. Then you will need actually another three to four months to gather all the goods together. And don't forget, you have to take cash uh, to China. To China. No cash without silver, so you won't be able to get any goods. And uh, after three to four months, you have to sell another three, so three to uh, four to six months to back, come back. So each and every one voyage of the uh, 17th, 18th century will last about, say, 80 miles regularly. So it was really not easy for them. And uh, so it was really only natural that you, uh, you would actually expect such a, pay, a return so that all the work will, won't be in vain. So the uh, 1596, then the Dutch started his first, their, their first expedition, or the, the, the trial sail. They come to Indonesia, and then they, they got a lot of uh, pepper, got a lot, lot of uh, nutmeg, and so on. And later on, they just uh, reached further and further. There was actually a, a, a description about the first trial sale of the uh, Dutch East India Company. There must be a, a, a mistake. Sorry, there should be a 100 times profit, not 100%. 100% won't be enough for them. And uh, that was actually to the uh, Sumatra area because uh, you can go further and the further you go, the more profitable it will be. So, uh, now this is the uh, story about how the Dutch East India Company was actually established in 1602 by the Dutch government. And uh, then the first permanent Dutch trading post was actually uh, established in Indonesia, in Batam. And uh, you know the term Batavia. Batava was actually a, a tribe of the Germans. I think the, most of the uh, Dutch people actually go to the Batava, and uh, they love to. Apply this name everywhere. So you have Batavia here, Batavia there. So in Indonesia, you can find Batavia as well. I think the Jakarta was then called Batavia. So uh, the uh, 1611, they started another uh, base, trade center in Batavia, Jakarta. So, uh, in this picture, you can see that it's the headquarters of the uh, United uh, East India Company. The place still exists as a uh, monument and as a museum. So, when the Dutch arrived in Taiwan, they found it was really very important. And, uh, to organize, to, to rule over this country. We have to re re remember one thing. Most of the so-called trading companies, they are not only a company now, like what we realize nowadays. At that stage, most of the trading companies, they have their, their power, they have their, they have their troops, they actually have a strong hold of, uh, say, weaponry, they are actually armed. Like uh, if you are familiar with the uh, European countries history, you know, for example, the, uh, the Hansa, right? The Hansa company of the German area, they even loot the uh, robbers, actually, these pirates. They rob everything they, 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 they can get. And uh, if they meet, say, uh, resistance, they just do business. For example, now this London, for a long time, was actually under the uh, Hansa's control. So most of the companies, they are not only a, a, a trading company, they have their, 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 
the military, they have their men, they have their weaponry, they just control everywhere. They started to rule over a place. It's what we call imperialism or the imperial activities. So there's the that's why the the British East Indian Company kind of uh, gained control over India for such a long time. And that's why the uh, Dutch East Indian Company came to the Jakarta over Indonesia for a long time. And that's why the Spanish East Indian Company controlled the Philippines uh, even longer. And Taiwan is actually under the Dutch East Indian control, uh, Company control. They organized all these kind of uh, tax collections and uh, low pavements. They sent a lot of uh, troops into the inland of the, 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 the Taiwan, try to try to convert people. Because uh, at the very beginning we still talk about the religious elements in these kind of activities. So the Spanish king, Philip II, allow a lot of uh, missionaries, especially the Jesuits, to travel with them worldwide, uh, free of charge. So uh, at the end of the 17th century, 16th century, a lot of Jesuits arrived in China, were well, actually all uh, taken advantage of this uh, offer of the uh, King Philip II, because the Jesuits, they think, or they <coughs> believe, that the uh, priests will actually uh, convert people worldwide to make up the laws of the Catholicism in Europe. And uh, that's why we have a lot of Jesuits in China. And uh, the Dutch did the same thing. They sent the priests to Taiwan, uh, to all over the road. Uh, wherever they go, they, have, they are actually uh, Dutch priests along with them. Therefore, a lot of the Taiwanese are originates are actually converted into uh, to a Calvinism. So this is actually a painting of the Batavia of the uh, of the last stage. Now, this is the, one of the earliest map of Taiwan uh, appeared. That was actually a photo line of the Taiwan. Uh, the photo line was actually a special type of map, C map. When, when we go back to the European history, when Columbus went to America, he had really no idea what, what, how it be. And uh, for a long time, before Columbus, the European <coughs> elites the world is flat. Now we use the term the world is flat, really actually the world is flat. But uh, in seven, before 17th century, people also believed the world is flat. There must be an edge. So if you should sail over the edge in truck to where, Nibiru, to hell, to whatsoever. And uh, what Columbus believed, well, the, the earth is actually a a ball, and uh, actually you can sail to the other end of the world. But uh, again, the people will ask if you should sail to the other end of the world. At that stage, nobody realized anything about gravi gravity, and uh, if you should sail, then you might drop as well. So whether the world is flat or a round fall or a ball fall, there will certainly be no end. And, uh, the people in, in, in the 15th century started to draw sea maps, but they have a different idea to divide the world. And they have a different way uh, to find a route, because uh, you can see there's no latitude or altitude here. There will be some lines which shows you that you have to go, for example, from this route. You have to go, uh, start, say, from uh, Good Hope, you have to sail to for some certain uh, direction for such a long time, then you can reach square, and from where you took another route, you save all such and such time, and then you will reach 
and other places. That's the idea of the popular. Right? Uh, before the 17th century, most of the, the sailors used this kind of map. And they, say, they sailed around Taiwan and they started to draw this map. But this is already very advanced. The first map of Taiwan showed that Taiwan was actually divided by a river. And it was actually two islands joined together as, uh, as the land. And uh, this is already uh, more advanced. And uh, there was actually driven, uh, drawn by Dutch Johannes showing that the idea of Taiwan was actually quite vivid already. And then they started to build up, set up a port, a trading position, the same trade, in, east, in the southeast part of Taiwan. Nowadays we call it Tainan. It was then a lagoon, as you can see here. And there's a bulwark, and uh, you can see that uh, it was actually very convenient for the boat of that stage, because uh, the little boat of that stage was actually easier to go to the inland, to go along the uh, river. And on this lagoon, the, the boat can easily be, uh, be parched. And as you can see, that it was actually a trade center post established by the Dutch people and uh, they found it very convenient. So 1624, the uh, Dutch started to rule over Taiwan and uh, imported a lot of things to Taiwan because uh, for the Dutch people, you are not only doing business, you can collect tax, it would not be a bad idea either, and in order to collect tax, you need some kind of uh, uh, agriculture or cultivation. But the local people at that stage, when Dutch arrived in Taiwan, there were hardly, hardly any Chinese from mainland China, from Han Chinese. Most of the inhabitants here in Taiwan were actually aborigines. Later on, we will give you an idea about the Taiwanese aborigines. Right? But anyway, the aborigines, they are divided into different uh, groups. Called show. All these little groups, they are independent from each other. Therefore, there was never an organized authority. They sometimes don't even understand each other. Each and every group have their own language, their own tradition, their own culture. And uh, there was, they can come to some serious fights uh, between each other. And therefore, it was very easy for Dutch to establish authority in the in nowadays Thailand. And uh, it, they found that Thailand was actually a plan and uh, flat land. So it was very good for cultivation. And as you know there was actually a term called the uh, the uh, the, the uh, economical products So, for example, they need sugars from everywhere. They need camper from everywhere. And uh, the Dutch arrives in Southeast Asia from sugar camps, sugar camps there. And as I said, sugar was actually a very good thing, <coughs> very good goods for the uh, exploitation. So they decided to come to Taiwan and they want to cultivate Taiwan. Uh, they cultivate to, to plant uh, sugar in Taiwan as any other so-called plantation colony. Right? Just like the, uh, the Europeans would like to uh, grow coffee in Africa, protein in Ceylon, in, in Ceylon, Sri Lanka nowadays. Or they always also would like to uh, grow sugar cane in Taiwan. But these kind of activities cannot carry out the vote by the Aborigines, because the uh, Aborigines are still kind of uh, Hunters and uh, from the gathering economy. So they attracted the Dutch East Indian Company, attracted Chinese from mainland China to Taiwan, provided them with, uh, 
is a uh, cows, also the cattle sort, were imported from, from India. There was actually hardly any cows, cattle sort, in Taiwan. So under the Dutch rule, Taiwan became cultivated. Taiwan became a, a, a place of uh, importance for the uh, trade, for the uh, mercantilism, and therefore that's why we started to introduce, to talk to, 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 to the Taiwanese history from the Dutch period. So we have a 10 minutes break, okay?